What's up y'all, Ray here, and I have partnered up with Crafted Elements to bring you a long line of videos on how to, what not to do, how to make this, how to make that, how to make templates from their molds, all the different things, and I'm really excited to start with this one. We have their 18 by 12 by two inch silicone mold here that we are going to make a charcuterie board using this cur really quilted actually, not curl, this is a lot of quilting, a uh, piece of maple here. We're gonna get it cut down, get it put in this mold, mix some epoxy, pick our color of course, and then we're going to get it all put in here. So that way once it's done curing, we can get it out of this mold and we'll show you how easy it is whenever you use the proper methods of silicone release spray and getting it out, sanding it down, cleaning it up, using the router template to make a custom handle on it and finishing it with some walrus oil, of course. So the first thing we want to do is we want to figure out what we are making. We're making a charcuterie board. We're not doing anything with the, um, the pulls for the handles. We're not adding feet to this or anything like that. It's just going to be a serving board that is going to have a handle that to be stored. It may kind of like hang on a hook like this or be put up in a cabinet or something like that, but it's going to have a nice handle on it so that way you can grab it. I haven't decided if I want to do a couple handles on either side because of the size of this mold. You typically don't want to do that because it takes a lot of the real estate in the middle. There you go from a 18 inch mold to with 18 inches of usable space, maybe like a couple inches off from where the handle is at to going from that from a full 16 inch actual usable space tray to a 14 or 13, depending on where you position those handles. and. That just is not the best. I mean, I, my math is probably off on that, but I'm just throwing out rough numbers. So like I said, first thing we do is we figure out what we're gonna do. We have a baseline and we know, okay, this is our piece. Let's get it cut down, figure out how to cut it and get it in this mold, calculate how much epoxy we need and then get started on that. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is like I said, you wanna figure out what size, of course, you're going to do your tray. So with this piece of maple, it is, almost 32 inches by nine and an eighth on the longest and roughly about seven and three eighths on the shortest or the skinniest part and the widest part, whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to figure out what would be the best look. Do I want to do this thicker part and have it where there's not a ton of epoxy on it? Because whenever I do have this piece, to get it to the width, I'm over here losing things, to get it to the width that I want it, it is going to end up about up here. Do I want to have it with less epoxy or do I want to have it with more epoxy? And with this piece, because of how it looks with all the quilting mostly down here, I really want to use this part. I have some knots and things like that, but these will actually fill with epoxy. I'm gonna go and take a screwdriver and kind of see if I can clean out some of that stuff. And if I can't, or a flathead screwdriver, should I say, and if I can't, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave it because the epoxy will fill it and it'll solidify and it'll make it, and once it cures, that's, that's what I mean by solidify, it will make it uh, a rigid piece and it'll add a little more character to it and stuff like this, like all these spots will fill and so it, just, it will look really pretty. So what I want to do now is I'm gonna go take my, marking utensil wherever I, whatever I did with that. I'm over here losing things. So we're gonna, give me one sec. So apparently I took it all the way over there. So I am going to mark 18 inches. And another thing you wanna make sure is with these molds, you wanna make sure your piece is nice and square. So I like to take my woodpecker square here, wind it up and Okay, so we're good there. So now what I want to do is lose my pencil again. As a woodworker, I'm sure all of y'all know that struggle. I'm gonna get my, my mark here at 18 inches. And then I'm going to take this to, normally I would take it to the table saw and get out my crosscut sled. However, I've got everything set up. My table saw is kind of, um, I don't know if you want to say indisposed. It's got it's unusable right now. So I'm gonna take this to the miter saw, cut it up real quick, and I'm gonna bring it back and I'm gonna show you exactly how it looked in this mold. All right, so now we have our piece cleaned up and it will fit perfectly in this mold. Another thing I wanted to I forgot to mention actually is you wanna make sure your piece is thick enough for what you're wanting to use it for. Because with epoxy, what it does is it heats up, it causes an exothermic reaction, and it causes a lot of heat if you don't watch it it can actually get too hot however that's why we use deep pour because it can 
be poured deeper and not have too much heat generate from that. So you wanna figure out how thick you want your piece, how thick or how deep you can pour your epoxy. This is uh, the epoxy resin stores, deep pour. It can pour up to two inches deep on one pour. You can do multiple layers if you wanna do something thick. However, I just like to do one pour with if I can, makes it a lot easier. So this isn't a one, this is, not is, isn't. Words are hard. So this is a one and one sixteenth piece of maple. So this is plenty thick. This gives me a little bit of room so that way I can send it through the planer on some shallow passes and just kind of clean things up. But I'm gonna try to make sure to pour it up, about as close as I can to um, that, that mark so that way I'm not pouring over or having to clean up a lot of stuff. So with these pieces and the ones that have this more live edge, this isn't really technically a live edge, but it is more of a live edge than uh, just your plain stock where it's like this, you know, dimensional lumber. So what you wanna do is it is a little textured right here. And so this, I don't really need to do anything about, but if it's a lot, if it's got a lot of like crud here, or it's got a lot of things that like flake off, you really don't want that stuff because your epoxy will grab that. And with that heat, and then once it cools down, it's going to pull that apart and it's not gonna cause a, or it's gonna cause it to not bond properly. And so what you wanna do is you wanna take a wire wheel to that and just a basic drill. And then whenever you do that, you just take that wire wheel and you run it and it's gonna clean that up and it's not gonna take out any of that character right here. It's just gonna keep it nice and smooth or it's gonna smooth it up and make it where it's rough enough where that way it'll cause that bond and it won't have anything chipping off and you won't have your board cracking or anything like that. So that's no fun. So I'm gonna check out this little, this little hole here. So it looks like this is good. So I got a couple pieces that are coming off. So I'm just gonna kinda roughly get in there and clean up all this stuff. Because like I said, a lot of this stuff will fill and it will get, it'll all seep into all the cracks and this isn't a big issue. It's just really whenever it's on that edge is where it will cause that big issue. So. So I think I'm gonna hit, hit this with some compressed air real quick. So that's cleaned down enough. It's got it's got a good amount of stuff out of there. So now once I fill it, I'll be I'll make sure to put some epoxy in there, and that way it will not uh, or it'll just fill and it won't cause any issues. So now that our piece is cut, essentially, you can see that this roughly is what we are going to be working with here. So this is going to be our part that is going to be filled with epoxy and then the rest will be wood. And then once we clean everything up, it'll just have a wood and three edges of wood and then three edges of epoxy um, on the ends here. So, and on the side. So now what we need to do is now that we have our piece, we have our epoxy ready. We have our pigments ready. Let's pour. Not yet, actually. What we want to do is whenever you pour epoxy, especially with something as thin as a deep pour epoxy, it is going to cause this to be a buoyant piece. I mean, we, we all know if you get a piece of wood, you throw it in the water, it's going to flow. I mean, it's just, it's buoyancy. So what we're going to do is what we need, we need to find something heavy enough, which I have actual weights that I can use for this situation, which I will go find. Okay, and so using a 10 pound weight, that should be enough to hold this piece down. Now we're ready to pour. I'm sure some of y'all have caught on by now. This is not the proper way to do this. A lot of people think that I've got my wood cut, I've got everything I need, I just need to mix up my epoxy and pour it up and I'm good to go. Wrong. What you wanna do is you want to coat your silicone mold with your silicone mold release spray not silicone based mold release spray. That is only good for like metal work and different things like that whenever your mold is a piece of uh, aluminum or any other kind of metal or uh, any other kind of material. What that is going to do with the silicone, it is it's going to cause issues. It's not gonna do exactly what you want. You want to get something like Smooth On or uh, what is it, uh, MG Chemical or something like that. I forget what it is, but you, want to, you can find these on Amazon. They're like 20, 25, 30 bucks a can, but they last you a long time. If you want this mold to last you 20, 30 pours, then you need to use the proper techniques and use the proper things that need to happen for them to last long. And cause what would happen is whenever you do put your uh, epoxy in here, it's gonna heat up, 
And so it's gonna expand and then it's going to contract whenever it cools down. And what it's gonna do is gonna grab onto that silicone. It may not grab it right away, but eventually it will start grabbing onto it and pulling chunks out of it. It'll start pulling pieces out of it and those voids will start to fill with epoxy. Then that's more to clean up. Then that's more that's gonna be um, gripping onto your board. So when you do pull it away, then that could be more pieces that come off and then it's just a nightmare. And then you just have to throw the whole thing away. So. I am going to now get all the junk out of here and we want to do really you want to do a N95 mask I don't have one so I'm going to spray this I've got my air filtration system going and so that will clear everything out of here and this is a well ventilated uh, room so it's not going to cause any issues. So I'm gonna give it a quick spray. This has been coated properly. We are going to, you don't wanna to go too heavy on that because then it will start to pull into your mold and that's just not good. You don't want it to start pooling because then you're gonna have bubbles and different things like that, like big divots in your, in your mold and it's just, it's a nightmare. So now we wanna do it the right way. We wanna get our piece, put it in our mold, make sure it's tucked up against that wall. You are gonna clean up some of this stuff, so don't worry about if your mold's kind of like leaning over a little bit because it's kind of, you know, misshapen or whatever. I mean, you, you really wanna clean up these edges whenever you're done. We're gonna get our piece of wood, put that down. Now we're set up and now we're ready to start figure out, figuring out and calculating exactly how much epoxy we need because I don't wanna just start filling up things or using this or using this one, not having enough, and then my pigments are all thrown off and it just can be a nightmare. So. A lot of places like the epoxy resin store, which they are the ones that I only use. I only use their deep pour, their, their super gloss and different products like that. They're my favorite resin out there. I've tried a ton of resins out there, but they are my tried and true. And I, I really like them a lot. So I'm gonna figure out exactly how much I need by taking a few measurements here. So I'm gonna measure, so we're gonna do about four inches, let me see. So it's about four inches. Actually, you know, I can write right on here because this will be sanded anyways. So four inches by, let's say three and a half. And then on the smallest, it's about three. So we'll say average is three and a half, you know, and you want to do about 10% more. So that way you have um, a little bit of, of, of wiggle room, if you will, by 18 inches. So, so we'll do three and a half by 18. And then this is only one and six, one and one sixteenth. So let's see, let's see. I'm gonna do a, a, a quick calculator real quick. And then I'm gonna tell you exactly how much, how many ounces we're gonna need right here. All right, y'all. So I decided to just get on my laptop to just kind of show y'all if y'all can even see this. The Epoxy Resin Store has a uh, calculator right here where you just plug in the length, the width, the height, and then it tells you exactly how many cubic inches and then how many gallons it is. So for what we need, we need 0.33 gallons. So converting that to ounces, we need roughly about 42 and 42.24 ounces of epoxy so i'm not going to be using this little guy right here because it's just not going to work so what i'm going to do is i'm going to come over here and it looks like i can do let's see 40 ounces let's go to a three to one ratio sorry i'm over here having a scroll moment i'm peeling off the, epoxy, the old epoxy from here so let's see if i fill it up to okay so the max this thing goes oh wait no three to one that'd be Okay, so yeah, so where this is at, I'm gonna fill it up to the five on the first, with my first part, the, uh, the actual epoxy, and then I'm gonna go up to the next five on for the hardener, and then that is going to give me a little over 40 ounces. So with what this is, and since it's a three to one, I don't wanna get all into the math about doing all the pours and stuff like that. I go off of the lines. If it's close enough, if not, then I go back and I do something different, like uh, actually like, weighing out the right the correct amount of ounces of the hardener or of the hardener and then of the actual epoxy itself so let's get this filled up and then we are going to mix it up and then we are going to figure out our, our uh, pigment color all right so my alarm started going off on my phone so i had to restart everything so i'm gonna have to get another thing of 
epoxy because I, I'm, I'm about roughly halfway to where, to where I need to be. So, thankfully, I stocked up before I did this video. So, I'm good to go here. All right. So I have been doing epoxy for probably about a year now, and I've done all kinds of trays, and I just did my first clock not long ago, and different things like that. And I'm really excited to try out some of the silicone molds that uh, Crafted Elements does. Like I have a couple cross molds and different things like that, or different molds like that. And I'm really excited because I mean, I've never really done anything outside of like small molds, like with my son. And so I'm really excited to give it a go and see exactly how they work out and stuff. So, all right. Oh, that was perfect. Absolutely perfect. Cool. So, all right. So now what I want to do is I want to get my mixer here. This is just a paint mixer, nothing fancy. Allway actually sent these out to me. They're a really awesome company that has a ton of different supplies for around the house. And they sent me a ton of them, which I have ranged from this size to the ounce, uh, little quart bottles and things like this, uh, to or jugs cups, whatever you want to call them, two big old five gallon buckets where the paddles like, I mean, it's like that big and it's like that wide, it's huge. So, um, so now what I want to do is I want to start mixing this and make sure it is clear and not this like murky color, which you can't really see because of the color of this. But once I do that, then I will be ready to add pigments and then I can mix it some more. Typically you want to mix it anywhere from three to five minutes. And it's not just kind of like, eh, it feels like three minutes and it feels like five minutes. Cause if you don't mix this properly, it will not cure properly. You may have half of your board cure and the other half not. And then that's just a total mess and it could even ruin your mold. So I'm going to get this mixed up, but first let's pick out a color. So with this lighter piece of wood, you really want to pick something that complements it well. So I have from Eye Candy Pigments, they're another one of my sponsors. They have sent me Anana Tur Turquoise, which I have done a board in this and I really like it a lot. You should kind of see it there. And then they also, I also have this Kaiso Green, which I have not used because I have not used because it's even still in the plastic here, which I'm not going to be able to open it. I'm not going to try it. There we go. So it's still in the plastic and so I'm kind of thinking I might want to do a tray in this green or even I've done one in this with some, uh, uh, what was it, uh, spalted maple that I actually sent to Eye Candy. So you will see on there uh, in their storefront uh, this uh, Mirasaki Violet and a really pretty uh, gold handled tray with the spalted maple and it's just absolutely beautiful. I fell in love with the tray and I mean... I kept hearing that everyone was wanting to steal it from them and stuff. So really you want to pick something that complements the, 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 the piece. So with these colors, I really wouldn't want to use these with like walnut. With walnut, I'd want to use something like more lighter and not with like these darker, more pastel-y looking colors. Like the, I don't know, it's just, it's just really on what you think and how you feel would be the best complement to the piece. Cause you don't want to have something like a really dark wood and something like like black walnut and then have something like really out there like orange like that i mean yeah that may look good but to some people you that you know it may not be something that would be your taste so i picked these three colors and i think what i'm going to do is since i haven't done a pour in this color i'm going to go with the kaiso green i think it's going to look really good up against this uh quilted maple and once I get some oil on it and everything finished, it's gonna look really good. It's gonna pop really well. And I'm really excited about that. So let's get this mixed up. I'm gonna set a timer for three minutes. And then once I'm done, I'm gonna add some pigments to it. And then I'm going to go from there. So I'm gonna bring you all over here so that way you can actually see what I'm doing. Okay, so I've got y'all right there up close and personal. And you can see, you can see all those striations, striations, however you wanna call it. So I'm gonna go ahead and start mixing this and you'll see how it starts to clear up. I'm actually gonna mute the volume because it can be kind of loud, so, and speed it up.
Okay, y'all, so I kind of want to take a minute to show y'all. You can see how there's a little bit of those lines still in there, but they've cleared up significantly. I still have about a minute or so on my um, timer, so I'm gonna keep stirring this, and then I'm gonna add some pigments and then finish it out in the last couple minutes. All right, so y'all can see, or I'm sure y'all saw, that it is clear as can be. So one thing you wanna note that whenever you use this deep pour, it's okay to use a paddle because any bubbles that end up in it are not going to be an issue because they are all going to come to the top and then they are all going to pop. You can send this in a vacuum chamber to get out more of the bubbles, but since we're doing a high pigment, or should I say just since we are doing a pigmented pour, you're not gonna see a lot of those bubbles. Of course, you don't wanna hit this on high speed and just you know sit there and crank on it for like 10 minutes because then you're gonna add a lot of air into it and it's not gonna be a good thing. So now I'm gonna take our pigments and I'm going to just add the slightest in there. Ooh. So we're gonna see what that looks like. Apparently we're not wanting to focus, but we're gonna see what this looks like whenever we mix it and then go from there. All right, so now we're done and you can see that really pretty color in there. So now I'm gonna put my drill on high, give it a quick little spin. And then I'm going to actually put this over my mold because if it drips, it will not be any, it will not cause any issues. All right, so now let's get y'all adjusted so that way you can see me actually pour the epoxy. All right, so now we're ready to pour. Like I said, this will not be any, it will not be an issue whatever pouring because this will adhere to this. But if this were a live edge piece where it had something like uh, kind of chipping off, you would want to clean all that up. So now I'm going to pour our epoxy and we're going to see exactly how pretty this color is up against this piece of wood. Okay, y'all, so y'all can see a lot of these bubbles rose up to the top, and then you can also kind of, well, you can't really see it from your angle, but let's see if I can turn it a little now that I poured. But in these edges, they're gonna start filling up. I am absolutely perfect right here. You can see where it's kind of done a little bit of pour over, but I think that's just where I uh, moved the mold itself. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take a heat gun or a blowtorch or something like that, some way of popping these bubbles on top. And then I'm just gonna kind of swirl it. It's not ready to be swirled right now, but I'm just gonna show you what that looks like whenever uh, this piece is gonna be finished, uh, what it will look like. Cause I'll come out here after it's cured for about a day. Um, since it's cooler here in Texas right now at the making or at the time of this video, um, I'll be able to come in here tomorrow night where this will be more of like a pe uh, peanut butter consistency and then I can come in there and do some like really pretty swirls. So let me get these bubbles out and then I'm going to swirl it so that way you can see how pretty this piece is. So let me turn you a little bit. Okay, so one thing to note with these silicone molds, they can withstand a high heat, but they cannot withstand a heat that is high enough whenever you are to hold this right on it, it's going it's going to mess it up. It's going to ruin your mold. So you definitely don't want to do that. Um, I just realized that I did not fill those voids on the other side of the board, but I can just mix up some one-to-one -one real quick and then use the same pigment color and then fill that. Uh, essentially what a one-to-one -one is, it's a thicker epoxy for more shallow pores, for um, uh, flood coats and different things like that, and for uh, fixing little holes like that. So now I'm going to do some swirls in this. I just take a, just a little popsicle stick. You can see this is one that I've already used, nothing fancy. And then you just come in here and just kind of, you know, do some little swirls, swirl action here and 
can kind of see what this is going to look like. This has got a really pretty like emerald green color to it sort of and I am I am not mad about it, you know. So a lot of people like to do like little teeny tiny swirls. I like big swirls, honestly. And like I said, it's not, none of these are gonna stick because whenever it starts to do the exothermic reaction, it's going to um, cause a lot of like cell looking things that are um, just really pretty. So, so you can kind of see, this is a more or less idea of what it's gonna look like. And then of course, once we come in there, and we pick our side, which I'm thinking I'll probably do, um, I don't know if I wanna cut into a lot of this epoxy. I'll probably do the uh, other end where there's less epoxy um, for the handle, just so that way you'll just see a little bit of the epoxy on here, and it'll be mostly wood uh, for the actual handle itself, so we won't have any like warping issues or anything like that. All right, y'all, so now that we are at this point in the process, this is the boring part. This is the part that's not super exciting. You wait and you, or well, you don't wait. I mean, you can wait, but I mean, you probably need to do other things. You let this sit for a couple days, a few days before you really demold it. Uh, let it sit, like I said, a day before you actually come in there and do your final swirls. Um, I don't know if y'all noticed, even before I moved y'all back over there, it was already starting to cause the exothermic reaction. So you can see a lot of the like, bubbles building up like coming together and then coming up as big bubbles and then the swirls are kind of like almost completely gone at this point and so um yeah at this point we're just going to let this sit and we're going to come back to it and then we are going to swirl it and then we're going to let it sit some more like i said and then we're going to demold it and then we're going to kind of run it through the planer just to kind of get it roughly cleaned up uh of course we're going to fill those uh those voids of course on the other side but before we let this fully cure I'll, uh, I'll probably do that real quick so that way it's just, you know, there. And then um, clean it all up and then get the handle cut and finish this board with some walrus oil, so. All right, y'all, so we're out here this morning. It has been roughly 12 hours, or I'd say a little less. And we're gonna check our temps. So we're at 81 on the deeper part. We got about 81 all around. So I'm gonna try to swirl it, but I really don't think that it's ready, but you can see this is what I was saying, how it causes that exothermic reaction here. So let's see, okay, yeah, it's still, still too liquidy. None of these will actually stick. But it is getting a lot thicker though. So we shall, leave it until tonight where it should be ready. So I'm gonna pop all these bubbles real quick. All right, y'all, so we're back and it has been a few days. Realistically, it's been five days. Um, so at the time of this video, three days would have been Friday. Here it is Sunday now, and I'm just now getting to this. It's been a crazy weekend, but that's neither here nor there. So this is fully cured so we can remove our weight, which really I removed the weight to see what would happen uh after i poured this and nothing happened but i didn't want anything to, be, to, to float up and to cause any issues or anything like that you can see um in my mold here a little bit probably like let's say maybe like three sixteenths you know of an inch maybe about a quarter of an inch maybe, essentially that epoxy has retracted because of heat and cause the level to come down. And another thing is these, um, apparently my light's turning off, and also these uh, voids over here, if there's any gaps, they are going to fill with more epoxy as well, but it's okay because that stuff will clean up and it won't be an issue. Another thing I love about these uh, silicone molds is like any splashes like this, they just kind of come right off. So we're gonna demold this now and I'm gonna show you exactly how easy it is. Uh, normally with one of my normal my normal molds, my H HDPE molds, I would be getting a rubber mallet, which is right here, and I would be going around and banging the sides and getting it, you know, released off of there, and then I'd be hitting the back, and it would just be a lot. But with these silicone molds and your mold release spray, all you do is simply pull up the edges and then give it a kind of like a, not really a push, but like even really like peel it away. So we're gonna listen really close.
All right, and just like that, it's off. So it does have a bit of texture to it because of the silicone mold, um, but it's nothing that the planer is not gonna take out. So really excited about that. And it's nice and clean and clear and everything is gone. Um, the silicone mold release spray really helped out um, with the uh, release of this. There's no damage to the mold, so I'll be able to use this a good chunk. Um, I think they say you can get at least 20 to 30 uses out of each of these molds. So now you can see this really pretty color. You can see the pour over over here. You can see it over here and then that edge. But the thing is, is so what we're gonna do now is we're going to take this to the table saw uh, oh look, something you noticed. You can see where that edge kind of was bowing out and it caused it to kind of be a little bubbly right there. So I'll find me a nice flat side. Okay, doesn't seem like I'm gonna find one. I think I had it. Check it out. Okay, so yeah, this one's pretty pretty square. So I'll take this more square edge um, and I'll square it up to the table saw and I'll just get everything squared away and then that way it's all nice and clean. And so whenever I do send this to the planer, I'll uh, flatten it on this side because the bottom's super flat and then I'll flip it over and I'll flatten this side and then everything will be good and cleaned and then I will be ready to add my template to it. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. All right, y'all, so now that our board is cleaned up, everything is square and it's all ready for sanding, before I do that and before I get my template on there and traced out and everything rough cut, I want to just kind of see what this grain looks like. Uh, of course, I'm gonna water pop this in between the grits. So I go 80, 120, and then 220. So that way it sands it smooth enough where it leaves a nice clean surface, but it's also porous enough to really let all of that uh, finish soak in. So what I like to use for my boards is walrus oil. Um, depending, I'll use furniture butter for some, I'll use their furniture finish, but for charcuterie boards and anything that has food on it, I will do their cutting board oil. So um, like I said, it leaves it porous enough to really soak in all that oil and then leaves it protected. And then I'll do a wax, a food safe wax, of course, after. So what I'm gonna do right here is I'm gonna take some isopropyl alcohol <clears throat> and I'm going to wet this board. And so I can really see exactly what that grain is gonna look like. So I really like this side. I think this is the side I'm gonna go with and I'm gonna think I'm gonna put my handle up here. Uh, so it'll take away a lot of this stuff that I tried to fill, but it ended up going away, but you can see all this quilting in there. Or I do the pop on this side. And you can see it's a little more subtle, but you can tell that this was the bottom of the board where a lot of that pigment um, settled on the bottom. And plus there's not as much quilting. So I definitely think I'm gonna go with this side. And so now alcohol dries really quickly. So that's why you do uh, any sort of like grain or not grain popping, uh, just visual water popping with alcohol because I mean, I don't know if you can see it, but I mean, it's already starting to dry and go away. So that's why I'm not really too worried about it whenever I put it on different things. So now what we want to do is now that we have figured out which side we're going to use. So I'm just really like taking in a lot of these like swirls and stuff like that. It's interesting, a lot of the uh, figuring that's happened. I, I do have a few little bubbles here and there. And it seems like they're these like little quadrants that have um, a lot of the bubbling, but I mean, it's nothing that I can use like a little bit of uh, CA glue to get rid of. So now I'm gonna figure out exactly what handle I want. Do I want something more like this? with the curved edge. So I'll, I'll do something like that, and then I'll trace it, and then I'll rough cut it. Or do I want to do something like this one here, where it's more boxy? So I definitely think I wanna go with this one, the little more, or the more boxy look. Um, yeah, I definitely like the way gonna have that transition right there so I think I might try to get as close up to that edge so it's just a lot less material coming off and since that's already cleaned up you know that way any material I do take off on the top it won't be a whole lot but uh so essentially I'll trace this out uh, I won't trace down here because this isn't gonna be get cut but I'm gonna trace this edge and then trace this and then uh, leave this right here because I could make this the same size as this template but instead I can just know that that is my edge and that's exactly where I want to go. 
and then I'll cut this out, or I'll trace this, and then rough cut this with the uh, the jigsaw because I can't really cut that with the jig uh, with the bandsaw. So I can cut this, but I mean, if I'm gonna have the jigsaw out anyways, there's no reason not to. So now you ask, how am I gonna attach this? Do I glue it on? No. Do I use double sided tape? You can, but the te the method that I like to use, which apparently I don't have any near me, so let me grab that. All right, so I like the blue tape and Starbond method. And what that is, is using some Starbond. I like to use their medium. It's a good middle ground for thickness. Um, so you can have different things like thick, medium, or thin. Be careful with this stuff. It's literally like water and it will get everywhere and it burns too, which is ridiculous. But uh, so now what I will want to do is I want to find where I'm gonna place this. I'm going to put tape on my template and then I'm gonna put tape on my board and then I will use Starbond CA on one side and then I will use their accelerator on the other. And so what that will do is if I use glue here and then accelerator on here, it will cause it to glue on here and bond perfectly. So I will do that after I get a trace though, because I don't want to glue this down. Um, I'm just losing everything. But so I just want to line everything up and make sure it's centered. Since it is so close to the edge, I'm not really too worried about it being, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go and find the center point right here because this board, the size that it is, is uh, thin enough where I can eyeball it well. All right, so there's that edge, there's that edge, or that corner, should I say. And then now I will go through here and trace the inside right there. And so now I'll know that I can cut this, cut that, cut that, cut that, and then cut this out. So essentially what I want to do is I'll, uh, I can even take like a, like a Forstner bit and just, you know, drill a few holes because then whenever I put that up to the router table, it will really take a lot of that off. What you want to do is you really want to take off most of the material so that way whenever you do come up to your uh, flush trim bit, uh, depending on the size, you don't want to put a lot of pressure on it. Like if it's a one quarter inch uh, thickness, not even just like the, um, the size of the adapter because there's one quarter and then one half which are your more standard sizes um, it can put a lot of strain on that and then it can cause your router bit to bend or break or cause more issues where if it bends it will destroy your piece or could it even hurt you so I'm gonna I'm just gonna kind of roughly cut about I'd say about within a quarter inch of this so that way I'm not getting too close and then that way it's not as, as difficult where I'm having to line up everything more precisely. I just have to line it up on these lines and then I know that whenever I do take it to the flush trim bit, it'll just be a couple, it'll be one pass, one pass, and then it'll be cleaned. And then with these, I can do um, Forstner a uh, bit probably every so often and then that will be able to, of course that's really rough, but that will be able to allow me enough space and visibility to uh, earn any visibility, but um, clearance to be able to uh, hog all that out easily. So now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna clean all this stuff up and then I will come right back in just a second. All right, y'all, so everything is cut roughly. So now I can use this to line everything up. My template, of course, that's what I'm referring to. Make sure that everything is still lining up and it's getting nice and clean. Okay, and then I look and see uh, roughly where my tape lines are so that way I know, put a piece of tape on this other side, put a piece of tape running essentially the full length so that way I can use the, this method to adhere my, my template onto my workpiece and then no, that it will not go anywhere as I am trimming everything up. 
All right, so it looks like I kind of missed with this piece. So I'm going to move it down some because I don't want to have any of this template barely holding on because when you have a router table going with a half inch flush trim bit that is a monster, an absolute monster, you definitely do not want your template coming off and one, ruining your piece and two, possibly ruining um, your life by completely destroying you because your piece slipped and you got messed up in the process. So, accelerator spray on one side, CA on the other, make sure everything is lined up before you set your piece down. Because once that CA hits that accelerator, it is, I mean, it's, it's on, it's adhering and it is not going anywhere. All right, so now my template's on. So now I can take this to the router table. This side is still even. Um, I think there's a small little lip right here, but it's nothing that's noticeable. Plus this is all just for this video. I'm not making this to sell or anything. I'll probably honestly give this away uh, to someone or I don't know, maybe I'll give it to one of y'all or I'll give it to my wife or something. So, and then I'll do for first, what I'll do is I will get these edges cause they are outside and they're easy. And then I will, um, you can see I kind of cleared some out just to kind of relieve some of that, that tension so I can clear this out and then run it across. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing. Yeah, I cleared out some of this space with a uh, flush trim saw and then uh, set the router bit in here, turn back on my machine and then whatever way the router bit is going, I will travel um, against it because if you travel with it, what that will do is that will actually um, push the uh, piece and then it will cause it to fly out and stuff. But um, essentially what I'm going to do, uh, what I'm talking about is I'm going to set the router bit where the ball bearing is going to run up against this uh, template right here. And so whenever it does, what it will do is it will just cut to the template and nothing more, uh, nothing less. So I'm gonna get all this stuff cleaned up and uh, we'll do a fancy time lapse of me trimming it all up because who doesn't love that? So. All right, y'all, so since I decided not to hit play, or uh, since I decided not to uh, hit record on my um, on my phone, I, I just, it didn't record. So um, what I was saying before was, I filled all of these little spots with uh, some Starbond uh, Black CA and the accelerator spray, just to kind of get everything filled. Uh, and you can see there's some a few bubble spots right here, nothing major. Um, I'm gonna, I've, you can see I've already started sanding. But I'm just gonna go ahead and hit those with a little bit of Starbond uh, clear as uh, I'm gonna hit it with the clear instead of the black, not as well because that's not the same thing. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm gonna get this all sanded down, and then I'm gonna blow it off, and then get all of those little spots filled, so that way you don't see any of those uh, imperfections or anything like that. So let's go ahead and start.
Okay, so now that everything is filled and sanded, um, you can still see some of the little micro bubbles on the bottom layer or underneath the surface, but it's not that I'm too worried about because like I said, this is all just for um, this, uh, all intents of purposes, using new equipment and stuff like that. So I'm not really too worried about it. I mean, it's still a really pretty board. So like I said, I'll probably just give it away to somebody. But so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take my water bottle. This one actually has water in it. And I'm going to pop. I'm gonna pop the grain and then I'm going to let it um, dry. And then I'm going to come back and I'm gonna sand it one more time. And then before the final sanding, I will route over all the edges with a round over a one eighth round over so that way it all looks clean and everything is smooth so um, you can see that what I did was I just kind of took the sander sanded it and then curved sanded it and curved so they're nothing perfect by any means but I mean they they definitely make it look a lot better than what it was before so now I just wait for this to dry all right, y'all, so now that we have sanded it back down after we water popped it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it over to the router table and we're gonna figure out exactly what we're gonna do. If we're gonna do a one quarter round over or if we're going to do something a little bit deeper. So I'm gonna show you what those two look like uh, over at the router table and we're gonna see exactly what we want on this because I kind of think I might want a deeper round over so that way the edges are kind of um, more of a, hard curve instead of a like a small curve yeah, but you'll see whenever we get over there so let's let's go check it out okay y'all so this is really what i'm referring to so this is a quarter inch this is a half inch and this is a three quarter inch uh curve on it so i think that if i were to go with something like this um putting it in the router table you can see that if i were to go the full depth uh because it's not gonna if not it's gonna leave a weird curve it is going to actually leave it too uh, deep. And with the one quarter, this would just leave the slightest little curve and I don't really want that. So I think that this one would be a good fit. It'll leave a good round over, but it's still gonna um, almost meet right there at the middle. So I'm gonna get that one in here. I had to change my collets because this is a half inch for my flush trim bit and for uh, my router bits, I typically have them as a one quarter. So and now with finding how deep you want it, you wanna get up under here and check your height up against your piece and you want to make sure it's nice and flat because if not you'll get a little line right here so you just want to kind of figure it out get close to it maybe run it through and then see where you're at and if you need to make any adjustments but always try to be under like take out less material than too much material because you can't put material back but you can take away more material so i think that where i'm at right here i should be good but if not, we will figure it out, so. Okay, so I did my test cut. It seems like I went a little too deep, so it's exactly what I was saying. So I can sand that out, but I definitely want to bring it up or down a little more, so. All right, so I went ahead and went a little bit more shallow or a, a little bit deeper on it because now it makes it all um, flow together. And so now I can just come back here and sand out those curves 
if this were for a customer or something, I definitely would not do something like that. Um, just little mistakes like that happen, but I mean, this is just for uh, this video, so I'm not really trying to make it perfect or anything. I'm just trying to, you know, focus on other things. So now let's take it back over there and sand it and finish this thing up because we're just about done. y'all so now that we are officially covered in stuff not a whole lot the reason i don't use a mask is because i have my uh ets 125 hooked up to a festool ct15 which eliminates most deaths uh really that stuff was just like what was left on the board and that got on my hands and that i've been wiping so that's why i'm not too worried about masks or anything like that but in other instances i do use my mask so but now I'm gonna get everything I need to go ahead and apply some uh, walrus oil onto this. So let's get that done. I always use gloves whenever I do my finish, even though walrus oil can be used without gloves. So that way it's just easy cleanup. I pull this off, I pull this off and we're good. So uh, I don't know if I have enough in this little bottle, but I do have my big bottle here. That's typically what I go through is the 32 ounce. So yeah, so Crafted Elements is the place to go for silicone molds, router templates, and different things like that to make really pretty boards like this with a handle where you don't even need to use feet or anything like that. Now I can just take this wherever I want, lay it out, put all my meats and different things like that. And I mean, realistically, with the amount of uh, wood that is on here, I could use this as a cutting board because you don't want to use epoxy as a cutting board because it can actually dull your knives and mess them up. So that's why you don't see a whole lot of epoxy cutting boards. And the ones you do see, typically people end up sharpening their knives a lot. And when you sharpen your knives too much, it just, it just completely ruins them and stuff. So craftedelements.com, y'all. Go there now and grab you one of these molds, one of these router templates, and just go check out everything else they have. So this was our first video for Crafted Elements doing um, the series that I'm just gonna be doing with them of how-to videos and do's and don'ts and different things like that. This video was more lengthy because it was my first video and so I kind of just included all the information that I could and it's a step, step by step. So really the more information the better on, on all the little do's and don'ts and things like that on all the all of the steps is really good. I mean, it might seem a little mundane and get muddled here and there, but I mean, whenever you really get to it and you start to run into issues, you start to think like, oh crud, what do I need to do in this situation? And with having videos that are extensive like this, it really can help a lot. So this was the 18 by 12 inch mold that I filled with a piece of quilted maple from C. Jacob Woods. He's on Instagram. I will link 
everybody that uh, has either sponsored or provided something or I purchased with my own money, like this piece of wood, um, that has you know contributed to this so that way you can go check out all their stuff so a piece of quilted wood uh from him quilted maple from him some uh deep pour from the epoxy resin store and then this is the kaiso green from uh eye candy pigments they are one of my sponsors so that was provided by them not for this video specifically but for uh testing purposes and using that so i decided what better to use a color that i like and that is provided by someone or a pigment company that I stand 100% behind. And the finish is Walrus Oil. You can go to the Epoxy Resin Store, Walrus Oil, Eye Candy Pigments, and use code Maker Rays for 10% off. Um, not Crafted Elements yet, but we can definitely have a link so that way you can get directly to there. And uh, comment on this video, like it, dislike it, do whatever you need to. Any sort of uh, interaction is good interaction. So thanks for watching this one, guys. Our next video is going to be over how to make a, a template from one of these silicone molds so that way you can get the perfect fit and look of the piece of wood before you put it into your silicone mold. So thanks for watching guys. Thank you to Crafted Elements for uh, sending all this stuff for us to be able to who make for us to be able to make this video for you and we'll see you on the next one and thank you guys so much for your support.